we're going to be talking about how we're going to increase strength. Do you need more strength? Not just physical strength. Do you need more emotional strength to deal with everything that you've been dealing with? How many say, I need some strength when it comes to mental strength? My mind had been wore out. How many said, I need spiritual strength for the battles I've been engaged in. I need help to overcome, to push back. The enemy's been pushing in, and I need spiritual strength. And how many of you this morning with me, raise your hand, I need it all the way across the board. I need my strength increased in every area. I need some help. And that's the greatest place that you can be is when you're in that position that you recognize you have a need. If you don't know that you have a need, it's very difficult for the Lord to meet the need that you don't think you have. He, he knows you have a need. He knows you need help. But until I get to the point in the place where I say, I need someone, I need intervention, I need a connection, I need the heavens to open up and to bring strength and help, deliverance and healing. In that moment that I recognize that there is a need, then I can ask for the help. He said, you have not because you ask not. He also said, if you call upon my name in the hour of your need, in the hour of trouble, I will hear from heaven and I will meet you and I will help you. And so we know that we're calling upon the name above all of the names. It's not just going through the motions of, well, I'm hoping. And so we recognize the need more strength. We recognize I've got to have more than what I have now. And we're looking for that provision. And today, you need help. You need strength. In some areas of your life, you're at the right place at the right time. As I know that the Lord, through his word and through the ministry of what he has for us today. And here's, here's how I know. Here's how I know it is a timely word because I had prepared something totally different. I don't know if you, for, the, for those of you that have ever been in ministry, and there's a couple of pastors that, that are here, and so this is what it is. And, and Pastor Andy, this is how it goes. I spend a lot of time digging, searching, and putting together what I believe is the direction of the Lord for what the people need agonize over these things, and I'll pray over these things and the different points and the different position and the, and the way to present it, and so it can be received. You know what I'm talking about. Normally, I start the message for the next week, you know, as soon as you know, I, I move into prayer Monday, Lord, what do you have for your people? And so you begin to develop these things and begin to put them together. And then after you do it all and you get it, and, and there were some really great illustrations I was going to share. It was some of you really going to, and so you, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. And you do all that, and then all of a sudden, at the last moment, the Lord says, er, he puts on the brakes and says, no, we're doing something different. <laughs> now, there have been times in my life that I said, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. I put a lot of time in this. I'm just going to, and, and those times it just is miserable. It falls flat. People will say, that was, meh, that wasn't so good. And so I've learned, even though I think, and what I think, we just set it aside and say, okay, God, as he's changed it, he's changed total directions. It's not just a little bit, total direction for what he has for you today. And this is, this is why I know it's those of you that need this, because God did this for you. He knew that you're going to need this. And he gave it to me at the, at the last moment possible to put this together. And the reason why he did that is so he knew if I had to download it from the Holy Spirit and there was no time for me to interject Jason. And so I know it's going to be from the Lord, okay? And here's the great thing about it, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Rita, this great thing about it is that if it messes and it don't hit and it just is a total wreck, I don't have to take the credit for it, nor do I have to take the blame for it. 
And some of you are saying, oh, huh, well, yeah, you're still going to, you know. All right. So we're going to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're, as we dive into this, and we're going to, and we're going to begin to, the, the understanding, the insight behind strength, to give to you the knowledge and insight what strength is. Some, some believe, well, you know, uh, and I, I'm talking to the, the generation that grew up in and around my generation. And how many remember at the, at the very last couple of pages of the comic books, there was, there was some advertisement. And it was advertisement, and, and, and this is how it went. Are you a 98-pound weakling? You remember that, Kelly? Getting sand kicked in your face, you know, and there's, there's this scrawny little guy. And then and it, was, it was the Armstrong method for gaining strength, you know, and, and so you could, you could order this book, and they would send you this book, and, this, and, and, you, be, and you go from a 98-pound weakling to this, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. This huge hunk of mass of muscle. And I, I thought, well, I need to read this book. You know what else I found out? You can read all the books you want. The only strength you're going to get is <clears throat> headstrong, thinking that you have what you don't have. But the way strength comes in the physical realm is you have to go and work out. You have to increase the strength, whether it is at the gym or whether it is in the construction area, you'll get strong by repetitively moving and, and strengthening muscles. And so we have this idea of strength in that way of gaining strength. But you see, the greatest strength we can find in Ephesians 6, verse 10. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Man, there's a lot to deal with right there. And the Lord and he began to show me this again, and he, he reiterated some things we're going to get to in the Greek there. But he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's the battle. That's what we're engaged in. But to understand what he was trying to give to us, some insight in verse 10, verse 10, be strong in the power of his might. Now, to under, really understand what Paul is saying to the church of Ephesus, you, you've, got to, you've got to really understand the Greek language. And how many know the word endomeo? Endomeo. Neither did I. <laughs> that is the word strong in the Greek. And this, let's say, well, why, why do we always have to talk about Greek and stuff like Hebrew and stuff? And, you know, King James was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll help you with that. And everybody has this picture of Christ when he was walking on this earth. He had a, this English accent, you know. Je Jesus, first of all, wasn't Anglo. He's Jew when he came. And he spoke Hebrew and Greek. Aramaic. And when he spoke these things, and when Paul was teaching these things, they used a different language than English. The Bible was originally written in the New Testament in Greek. It was later translated 300 AD into Latin and then into English. The, the issue is that because of those barriers and those language barriers that some words don't translate very well. You have a word in Greek that was original, that was the original language, the original way they wrote things and understood things, the way they were ministering. We take those words in Greek and Hebrew and try to translate them 
into English. And there's a lot that is lost in translation. Things don't translate very well. So some, some would say to me, this is the best version. This is the authorized. This is the only, and people tell me, this is the only version that God has authorized. And they will maintain that. And they, they have this idea that this is the best one. This is the only one. Do you know that the vast majority of people on the planet don't speak English? And so for the Chinese that speaks Mandarin, you're telling me that they have to learn English, but not just any language, 16th century English, for them to read the Bible and to understand what it's saying. Do you, you see how far that the religious spirit has put some folks in bondage? Release that and understand that there are so many English translations, none of them are perfect. None of them. But we have some that are close. There's word-for-word -word translations. There's thought translations. They take that thought and that phrase and they translate it. And so what I tell people, if you're wondering what Bible you need to read, what, what version is the best, I tell people it's the one that you read. Here's why. I want you in the Word. I love the poetic value of the King James Version, the Shakespearean way that it flows. But I also love the New International Version for the, or the English, the modern English version, even the New Living Bible. There, I, will, I will grab some of those translations because of how it is in today's language. A brand new baby Christian that is just getting saved you want them in the Word, and you want them to be able to feed upon it. You want them to be ingrained in them. And so that, therefore, this is why I encourage them. Get in the Word. Let the Word get in you. And for those of you that want to continue this conversation, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about it. But this is why we go back to the Greek language. We have to go back to the Greek to really... Because here, I want you to see something very powerful. There's three words here that talk about strength and strong and increase. And they don't really translate well into the English language. Not at all. It, you, you really understand the meaning of how to get strength. Because Paul says, be strong in the might of the Lord. Be strong. And, and, and I say, well, how does that happen? If you're just reading the English translation... You don't get it, but if you read, go back to the original language, it'll, he tells you how. Just in that same verse, that same verse gives an explanation. It, but you got to go back to the original language. And that word strong, be strong in the Lord, endomeo means to increase in strength. That's what it means, to increase. Not just be strong, I need to increase my strength. So he's given us a very specific reason. You need to do this because you're in a fight. You're in a battle, and it's life and death, spiritual life and death. And if you do not increase, and he tells us how to increase in just a minute, then you're going to be overwhelmed because you're battling against principalities, against rulers and high places, and you're going to need more than what you have. How many would agree with me that this last few years there has been an increase in this spiritual attack? That we have been in an in a all-out war spiritually as well as all other avenues and all other issues that, that come down the pipe. I want you to know the most important strength to receive today is spiritual strength. That will translate into emotional strength and physical strength. But the first is spiritual strength. So he said increase it in the, oh, to increase in strength but in the power. So to be strong. Be strong in the power. Now, a lot of people think that that word is dunamis, but it's not the dunamis power that is talked about in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, they shall be endued with power from on high when the Holy Ghost comes upon them. That word power in Acts chapter 2 is dunamis, but it's not the dunamis power that Paul's talking about. He's saying the power there is kratos. Someone say kratos. So you too can speak Greek. Now you can no longer say it's all Greek to me. Okay. Kratos. That's might with power. 
Also, many places in the word it is translated dominion. Ah, I like that because it brings a whole new insight to where I'm to to increase. Dominion. What is dominion? That is an authority that encompasses or is over. I need more authority over the situation. I need some more strength in the provision I need to get through this particular onslaught of attack. I need dominion over the mountain. Are you understanding what I'm saying this morning? I need to increase the dominion that God has given to me. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that you're to speak to the mountain. He's given you the authority to speak to your mountain. You speak to the mountain. He said, I've given you the authority. You speak to the mountain. I'm in you. The power of the Holy Spirit is in you. You have that authority. Speak to the mountain. Be moved. And he said, it'll be cast into the sea. A lot of times we're just sitting back. Jesus, you got to save me. Jesus, you got to rescue me. Jesus, you got to help me. I'm dying out here. All the while, God has already given you the authority for you to do it. The power of the Holy Spirit moving through you. Are you with me still? That is what he's saying. You need to increase in the dominion. Increase in the power, that authority. The might with great power, a dominion. And he said that a dominion of his might, his might, and it's ishos, ishos is the word. That word might, ishos, which means a force of ability. My ability to exercise force. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing, forcefully advancing is what he said, and violent men or authoritative men or strong men take it by force. That's what Jesus said. We have been given a directive and a provision to give light to the darkness, to give help to the helpless, hope to the hopeless, to open prison doors, to set the captive free. Jesus said, this is what I'm asking you to do. And as you go, preach the gospel. Open blind eyes, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. As you go, that was his commandment. He didn't say, as you go, you'll be following me. And I'm going to do all this and I just need some cheerleaders. No, he said, as you go, this is what he commanded you to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, preach the gospel. And I know just the way that most of you are looking at me like, who are you talking to? I, I have a hard time getting out of bed. Little old raise the dead. What do you mean? I don't have that authority. What are you talking about? I don't know, you must be talking about this. This would be our great message to be preaching to like Bible college students. No, this is a message preached to everyone that is called upon the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is a message for you. This is a message for me. This is a commandment that he said, and go into all the world, preach the gospel, and as you go, raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the leper, preach the gospel as you go. We cannot do that in our own authority and in our own power. You will fail miserably. You will, you will come up against someone and, and, and try to invoke that authority and uh, and as seven sons of Siva, that was a high priest, had seven sons, and they were using the name of Jesus. And, and up to a certain point, they were having some success. You read this story in Acts. And as they came up to one that had many demons, and the, 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 the demon said to these seven, seven men, he said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, 
but who are you? And one man overtook seven, and the word says, the Bible says, they went out bloody and naked, and that one guy overtook them and beat them up, and they didn't have, because they knew the name, but they didn't know the one behind the name. They didn't have relationship. Someone say relationship. And so this is why I'm saying you can go on your own power and you'll fail. But if you go in Jesus' ability and Jesus' provision and that anointing, someone say anointing, that anointing of the Holy Spirit as God is moving through me, that's why I need to increase in these areas. I have an ability and it is, it is at a static level. I know there are some things I can do. And then the things that I cannot do, I got to trust in Jesus as he has commanded me. This is what I want you. This is where I want you to go. This is what I'm having you to do. This is the area I want you to step into. I want you to trust me. Have you ever heard God say that? Have you ever had God speak to you on an individual basis and ask you, has you ever hear him say, trust me? I know you've heard that from other people and it might not have turned out so well. I was driving, and we were, this is before GPS. This is before smartphones. I think life was much simpler then. <laughs> and they, you know, and, and you, didn't, you, you didn't have no way to call anybody. To just, and, and so what you had to, when you're driving, especially cross country, and we're coming home from Bible college in Springfield, Missouri, and we decided, you know, there's a great way to, if you, you only can drive across Kansas so much and you just get bored. I, 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 I love people that live in Kansas, but you know, they, they live in a place that is desolate. And uh, you, you know what I mean? And you go visit your, your family there. You, you just, and I, I noticed recently that they started mixing it up. They'll even put a sign in front of the crops telling you what it is. This is corn. I'm glad they did that because I wasn't sure. And you go for, you know, and, and, and 10 miles later, there's a new one and it says, wheat. Genius. <laughs> Give me something else to look at besides nothing <laughs> for miles. And so as we'd done that, you know, a number of times back and forth, uh, during the breaks and during the summer, and we decided to come up with this idea. Let's go through Nebraska this time on the way back to Wyoming. Let's go through Nebraska. You know what Nebraska is? It's Kansas. <laughs> really is. And, and so, but you know, I never, never did this Nebraska thing. I never, never did. And so, we had to dig out the, the Rand McNally map, and it was the big book. You remember the big Rand McNally, and, and it was, and you had, and you had the the pages and the the and the, and the interstates, and and then the individual states, and so I had had the map, and and so we were ready to go, and, and had it all everything packed, and uh, and uh, we got all the way almost outside of Kansas City, where where we're going to continue to go up north into Nebraska. And I realized I left the map at home back in Springfield. And they're, they're expensive. And you, you, you stop there. That was like 30 some bucks back then. And that's a lot of money for a college kid. And the one, the, the brains of the outfits, she says, we should stop and get another map. Oh. I say, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> we, can, we can figure this out. How hard can it be? <laughs> Anything like Kansas, you just, it's the interstate all the way. Anyway, two days later, <laughs> after another map, <laughs> figuring out where we were and um, enjoying. That's what I'm saying. You said, have you heard somebody say, trust me? Whenever you hear God say, trust me, you're not going to get lost. 
He'll not give you a detour. But he will stretch you. He will put you in a position where it's going to be difficult. And it'll be beyond your ability. It'll be outside of the wisdom and the knowledge that you have. And he's going to ask you to do very specific things that are overwhelming and require you to be stretched. All the while, he's saying, trust me. And I believe that he's speaking to some people today with the situation that's in front of you. Put it back into his hands. I know that nobody here is a backseat driver. And there's, there's one thing that I, I, I when we ever were traveling, I, and some people say, well, that's just a control thing. When I'm, I'm tired and, and my wife will say, why don't, you, why don't you sleep and I'll drive. When somebody else is driving, I can't sleep. <laughs> we don't need to go into that. <laughs> I've been in some situations where I, I should have been awake. <laughs> So it's not, no, I'll, I'll drive. And the other thing is, when I am in the passenger's seat, I, I, I enjoy telling them how to drive. And the reason why is because usually the people that are in my passenger seat when I'm driving, they're telling me how to drive. So it's just, you know, okay. This is what you're supposed to do when you're sitting in that seat. That's just what the protocol is. You're telling the person driving, this is what you're supposed to do. Well, by the way, you missed the turn. Ah! Uh, we oftentimes, we will say, okay, God, I trust you, but we still want to be the one that's making the turn by turn. And the back seat, the back seat is a place for rest. Backseat is, if you really are trusting him, okay, God, this don't look right. This, and, or he's saying, I want you to step into an absolute trust. Trust me, I'm asking you to pray for this. I'm asking you to speak into their life. I don't even know that person. I want you to go walk up to them and begin a conversation. I don't do that. It's hard for me. I can't even talk to myself. And he's saying, trust me. I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the anointing that you need to minister in that moment if you would just trust me. This is how the increase begins. The increase, he said, be strong and in the power of his might. You need to increase in the dominion. You have to step into it. Not just lean into it. You have to step into that place of power. For the increase to take place. How do I do that? Not only by trust, but the obedience of walking with him. Okay, God, I trust you in this. I will do what you've asked me to do. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. I know it's stretching you. But that's where the increase is. God gives you the help that you need when you need it. Not before. He gives you the authority that you need when you need it, at the location you need it, not a day before. It's called faith. If you received it a day before, you would need no faith. You would just wade into it knowing that you were going to push back the darkness and move the mountains. But it's in the engagement, in that moment when you're speaking to the mountain, when you begin ministry is where the authority, where the provision and the strength shows up. Are you getting that this morning? Say amen. And so that is the moment that the increase, I need to be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. I need that increase in strength, that great power, the dominion, that ability of force. And that is why in the battle of the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places against the dominion of darkness to push back take back not just releasing the captives how many of you have been you're tired of being ripped off by the devil 
Satan has ripped you off. He has stolen family. He has stolen finances. He's stolen your health. He's stolen your mind. He's stolen days and years. He's taken from you. How many are ready to take some things back? How many are ready to begin to engage and say, okay, devil, you're going to give it back with interest? He goes on and he begins after, after he says, this is what we're doing. This is the battle. He said, then suit out in the armor. And many of you understand the armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. It's a suit out. The armor without power or without knowledge is no good. That armor that you're going to put on, your, and you put on the whole armor of God, the helmet of the salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, gird up your loins with truth, the feet shod with preparation of the gospel, shield of faith, sword of the Spirit. That's the armor that's listed in Ephesians 6. That you can put on the armor, but without the authority of the armor, without the anointing of the armor, you will fail. You remember David, King David, and he was, he was showing up to the battle. Here he sees this huge giant of a man, Goliath, yelling obscenities across, the, across that valley. And he's yelling at, he's yelling and he's cursing, cursing their God. And David said, it's not a cause is there not anybody here that's going to stand up and, 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 and do something here? It's very interesting. Uh, in our trip to Israel, we were able to go to that very scene, that very site of that, where that battle took place. And it's a perfect location for a battle. There's a, a sloping hill on this side and a sloping hill on that side. And the valley has its little creek bed going through then. So they would come down and they would descend and they fight in the middle of that valley. And so this is where it took place. And, you know, the bus pulls up and there's a bunch of us there. There are about 300 in this tour group that we're all together with. And we are all, and they said, this is the valley. And this is the, this is the, the brook. This is the, the, in the bottom of this valley here. That's where David picked up five smooth stones. And, and so we're all out there and I'm looking around, you know, reaching down, picking up rocks. <laughs> Put them in my pocket. I'm looking around. Everybody's doing the same thing, you know, because we don't know if we're supposed to or not. There's some things, some places that don't, you know, you can't, like the wailing wall, don't touch it. You know, don't, you can't do anything there. But it's over, and I'm, you know, I got not just five. I got, you know, probably like 50 these rocks in my pockets, you know, and we're back to the bus. And, and uh, the, the tour guide, he goes, okay, how many of you people picked up stones? He said, be honest. And so, you know, we're all raising our hand. He said, that's okay. Every Monday they bring in a whole dump load and dump it again. And so, <laughs> nah. I don't know. But anyway, it was, it was a perfect location. And I understood this battle. And, and David, David is seeing this. And David is understanding. Something's got to be done here. Something's got to change. They see the anointing. They recognize the anointing on this 15-year-old boy. I mean, this is amazing that there is mighty men, hardened warriors that did not want to step in and, and to do battle and defeat the enemy. But David, so it's not about your pedigree. It's not about who you are or who you used to be. It's about the anointing, the Holy Spirit that dwells in you to take out the giants. He tells Saul about how he took out the bear and the lion and he said, this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like them. And King Saul recognized the anointing that's on this young man. He said, okay. And Saul tries to put his armor on David, a full-grown man. And, and, and Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else, the word says, and so he's a big guy. So he takes his, his, his arm and he puts on this 15-year-old kid and he can barely walk. David takes the armor. I said, I can't use this arm because I haven't proven it. I don't know how to use this. He didn't, he didn't have knowledge of that armor, nor could he carry it. God will give you the armor that you need. Do you hear me? Not somebody else's armor, not somebody else's anointing, not somebody else's direction. He gives you the armor. He gives you the anointings you need for the battle that you're engaged in. And he will carry you in the knowledge of knowing what to do and how to do it with that same anointing. It's that provision he's given to you. Are you struggling? 
Are you struggling? Are you struggling in some area of your life? Are you struggling? Somebody have a struggle in an area, some a struggle in your heart. Are you doing okay some days, but other days you're struggling? I want you to have some insight here along the lines of the struggle. We do not struggle against flesh and blood. He said, we don't wrestle against, we don't struggle against those, but our struggle is with what? If you're still struggling, you're still in the fight. If you're not struggling, huh, you got to ask yourself, why am I not struggling? If you're still struggling with something in your life, if there's still an area that you're battling, you're still in the fight. You're still in the fight. Come on, you're still moving in the direction God has given to you. I promise you, we go from glory to glory. We go from one fight to the next fight. There are times of refreshing in between. And there's times of encouragement and strength. But the fight will continue until we see him. There will always be something. And so you will always need more strength. You'll always need a greater authority. That's the why. Psalm chapter 1 verse 1. We're getting closer to the end. Nobody said amen. I can keep going if you want me to. Psalm 1, verse 1. The, the, David started this, the very, first, the very first song in the songbook. This is what it is. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But that man, he delights in the law of the Lord, and his law, God's word, he meditates day and night. That guy, the man, the woman, the person that delights in the word of God and meditates on the word of God, he said, he'll be like a tree planted by the river of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does... He shall prosper. Someone say amen. No matter what he does, no matter what you do, you're going to prosper. I'm going to give you three things here along the lines of what, this, what's, what the psalmist is trying to draw out for us to receive and, and to increase our strength. Number one, who are you listening to? He said, the light's in the law of the Lord. The light's in the word of the Lord. That is where the blessing is. But this is what unravels the blessing. He starts out with by walking in the counsel of the, those that walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The, the man, you, you can't do it. He said, number one, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? If you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, in other words, there are people that are telling you stuff to do. They don't, they don't follow after the Lord. They might mean well. They might have wisdom and knowledge of the word. But if they're ungodly people and you're listening to the counsel, the direction, and the insight of the ungodly, he said, you will not be blessed. Not your, yes, and I'll move on. There are so many times that people want to give you their opinion. And I welcome all opinions. There are those that I don't listen to, but I welcome all opinions. If they are a godly person and they are walking with Jesus, then I want to hear what they have to say. I want to know what their opinion is on all subjects, on everything. The second thing to unravel strength is who are you hanging around with? It got quiet all of a sudden for some reason. Who are you hanging around? Now, it's important that we are ministering to sinners. Jesus was in the world, but not of the world, and he met with sinners all the time. I'm not saying that you just need to separate yourself and have this little, you know, um, uh, little coven of, of uh, you know, the, out there in the woods and just, you know, us for no more type of thing. Uh, no, we've got to be the light, and the light and the salt of the world is only good is when we're lighting the light in the darkness. And so we're going to be in the world and we got to minister to those. But you see, when you are spending your quality time with those individuals that are far from God, they're going to have more of an impact on you 
than you of, on them. Bad company, bad company, when we're hanging around, bad company. And it's, it's like the man that was um, many years ago, and I'm, I'm going to share this with you, and then we're going to wrap it up. Pastoring in a, a small mountain church, and this individual got saved. God was moving, come in, and he got saved. And he was he was in his late twenties, I believe, at that particular time when he just gave his life to the Lord. And he was at a really difficult time in alcoholism, and he and he was trying to get break free, and. When he first came in and got saved, God just, he, he took that, took everything from him. But then he, he fell back into it. He, he surrounded himself. He, he, he thought, well, I need to, my, my buddies, my old drinking buddies, I, they need this too. And so he, he began to hang around those guys. He said, well, I'm going to go to the party. I'm not going to drink, but I'm still going to go to the party because, you know, I, I want them. I want them to come. I want them to be saved. But what happened is, is as you begin to go to all the parties and go to the bars and, and, and those hanging around those individuals, it began to have an effect upon him. And, and to the point where a couple months later, he said, well, you know, I'm just, just one or two beers is not going to be a problem because, you know, you know, you do everything in moderation and so on and so forth. And that's what he's thinking. He's beginning to justify and God just set him free at one particular time. But as he opened those doors, now he began. And, and six months after he got saved, he's, now he's struggling with alcoholism again. And the same, same hole, same darkness that God brought him out of. Now he's finding himself in that same place. He's struggling. So he came and he began to explain to me, he said, this is what's going on. And this is, and he said, I, I know I, I messed up. I said, I, he said, I know I should not have done that. I should, he said, I, I was inviting my, my friends to come to me with me to church. And, and they said, well, if you come to the party, we'll come to church. But the problem is the pro a party on Saturday night, they were so hung over that none of them never came to church. And he's struggling with that. He said, what's going on? I said, well, you, 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 you want to minister to them, but you, you've got to steer clear of those issues that are going to draw you back into the darkness. God wants to set you free, but you've got to walk in freedom. And so we begin the road again on walking in deliverance. And I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, when you are being tempted and you're being overwhelmed with these things, I want you to call me. Said, no matter, you call me and I'll pray with you and we'll, we'll work it out. We'll I'll pray with you. And I'm, you know, whatever you need to do, we'll get there together. And that and the struggle was real to begin with. And so, you know, it was, it was to begin with a couple times a day. And he was doing good for a while and, and things were going well. I mean, he's baptized the Holy Spirit and on fire. And he called into the ministry and he's moving in that direction. And then I, then we had a, we had a trip planned and go, um, we were we were headed. Uh, this was this is we was in uh, Colorado. We headed back to Wyoming for a, for the holiday, and uh, I knew I was going to be gone. And uh, and he went. The enemy attacked him, full on attack. This this young man, and and he knows he's he's struggling. And he's he's. This is later on, he was telling me about this. He said, "All I could think of." All I could think of, it just bombard my head. And I know God is my strength, and I've been praying, and I got my, I'm in the Word, and it's, it's just so hard. And, and, uh, and, and, and the very next day, he's on his way to work, and he, he, he forgets his, his Bible, and, and, and he just, his mind is so overwhelmed with these thoughts that enemy pounding on him. He said, I know. I, I just get my head and my mind off of this. I'm going to... I'm going to turn on the radio, and there's a there was a Christian station that was that was available, you know, for in and out. And he turned on the Christian, but the Christian station wasn't coming in. He said, so he hit the search button, and the song first song that came on is 
I got friends in low places where the whiskey drowns and the bear chases. Ah! And just in every direction, he gets there to work. And in the friend, and the boss says, you know, uh, today we're, we're, uh, we're all going to have a, a, cel- we're gonna have a uh, barbecue. We're having a celebration because of we, everything that we had a great quarter and everything was done. Uh, we got finished in time. And so, and the boss you know, drags out coolers of beer, and and then and then a couple of guys are bringing the fifths of whiskey, and he's he and he's I'm saying the enemy is trying to destroy him, and he's trying to walk in freedom. Are you hearing me? How many of you have experienced something like this? The enemy just attacks you on every angle, and every and he's surrounding you and pounding on you and pounding on you and pounding on you. He gets on the phone, he can't get a hold of me because we're out of cell range, and he's all alone, and, and he's, at the moment he thinks, I'm, I can't handle it anymore. I'm just going to get drunk just to get this out of my head. And then he hears the still small voice of the Holy Spirit saying, if you call upon my name in the hour of trouble, I will hear and I will answer from heaven. He said, the only thing I knew how to do is just say Jesus. Just say Jesus. And he began to, and he thought he was just saying it quietly to himself. But his friends were saying, man, why are you yelling Jesus? <laughs> Why are you, what's wrong? He goes, he just said, I, I got to go. He tells his, his boss, said, I got to, I thank you for the, the barbecue and the party, but I, I've got to go. I got to, I got to get out of here. He said, as soon as I got into the truck, I begin to leave. He said, that weight began to shift. My mind began to clear. The presence of the Holy Spirit filled me again. And that was the moment that he was set free again. Now, I'm I'm sharing that with you, a very real experience of a young man that is in ministry today. Because it is where the power increased in his life. The authority and the power of dominion over the darkness took place in the battle not before, but in the battle. You need that same provision. You need that same hope, that same help. God is with you. Right now, he's with you in those arenas, but it's important for us to say, Jesus, I need your help. Lord, fill me again with your spirit. He said, you'll be like a tree planted by the water. The water brings life. Have you ever noticed all those wonderful cottonwood trees and all those peach trees on the side of Mount Garfield? (laughs) Ever notice those? No? You haven't seen them? It's because they're not there. You want to know why they're not there? There's no water. Water brings life. It brings nutrition. It brings strength. And he said, you'll be a tree planted by the water. A tree that is strengthened and the water that flows from the throne, that water, that river of life, the Holy Spirit will flow into you. I know that Jesus is with me, but it's important to know that I am in him and my roots are grafted into the vine. I am in him, he's in me. And when I'm planted, come on, when I'm planted in the water and planted by the river, I have life. He said, you'll produce fruit. Ah, we were at Farmer's Market last, last Thursday, and some of the peaches are coming off. Ah, I got to tell you about that. Some of those peaches, they're the, the, the early ones are small, and they're a little green, but they're still a peach. I love good fruit. Come on. Turn to your neighbor and say, where's the fruit? We produce fruit, good fruit. He said he'll give us strength in all seasons. I like that. My leaves will not wither in all seasons. When I'm going through the difficult times, when I'm going through the rough times, I'm still going to flourish. I'm still going to have the ability to be strengthened. 
I will still have the presence of the living God that gives me the help. It's not just the, not just the season of good when I'm doing well. It's also the season of the winter and of the storm and the difficulty that I'll still have strength. And he said, then whatever you do, whatever you do, you will prosper. Hmm. Uh, I remember two teenagers in my house hearing that word quite a bit. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. So I'm, I'm thinking oftentimes, whatever, whatever. He said, no matter what I'm doing. Think about that. No matter what you're doing. In your job. In your business, you'll prosper. In your health, you'll prosper. In your ministries, you will prosper. Whatever you do, you will prosper. Do you need his strength today? Do you need that increase in his strength? Then stand with me. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. To increase in strength with that authority and the power of dominion, give me the ability to move it by force. That's what he's saying, to increase in strength. Where's that strength? My strength is in the Lord. Where's my hope? It's in the Lord. Where's the anointing? It's in the Lord. And he gives to me what I need. So, Father, it's good to know that you're giving us the strength that we need when we need it. That it's flowing in, in the capacity to give us that increase. What I have was good for yesterday, but I need more for today. Increase, Lord. Lord in every area of our heart and of our life. Lord, increase physically. Give us the strength that we need physically, emotionally, mentally. Give us strength. The enemy is constantly bombarded and surrounded. Many of these, they need strength mentally to focus, to worship. And then, Lord, strength spiritually to increase in their dominion, to give them the ability to move it, to move those mountains. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Um, with every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and we're going to close the service. It's between you and the Lord, and, and, uh, but it's, uh, it's by calling upon his name is what I'm asking you to do. It's, you're just looking to Jesus. You're just saying, Lord, I need your help. Is there one here today that you are at your end you don't know what else to do you don't know where else to turn to and if the Lord doesn't give you the strength that you need you feel that you will fail you feel that it's you're on, on the nerve on the edge of breakdown or being broken you say I just need his strength is that you just lift your hand I want to pray with you thank you sis thank you thank you sir thank you ma'am thank you sir I just need his strength. I need his strength in my mind. I need his strength in my heart. I don't know what else to do. I'm turning to Jesus. Maybe you have some very specific issues in family or relationships, perhaps at a workplace. And you need direction, you need strength, knowing what to do. Perhaps it's in the help to get underneath the weight that you've been carrying. Feels like that burden is just so overwhelming. And you know that the Lord has asked you to do some very specific things, but it feels like you can't go much further without receiving some more strength is that you thank you 
Let's pray. I'm going to lead you in a prayer today again. You need his strength. Pray this prayer with me. Will you do that? Dear Jesus, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for your word. I thank you for speaking to me. I need you now more than ever. I need you in my life. I need you in my heart. I need you in my finances. I need you in my relationships. I need you in the ministries. I need you, Jesus. I'm asking, because you said, if I ask, with faith believing, and no doubt, it would be given. So in Jesus' name, I'm asking, give me strength, supernatural strength, the strength of heaven, pour into my entire being. Give me strength of mind, give me strength of body, and give me strength in the spirit to do what you've called me to do. I'm asking you, Jesus, to turn it around. And in your name, in Jesus' name, open up the heavens. And give to me what I need. Amen. And amen. Give him praise one more time. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Our prayer staff.